all of my relatives. Among the Lakota people, we would uh, formally greet one another by saying, all of my relatives. And it's a way of saying that we are all related, that we're related to things in the past, we're related to things that are present, we're related to things that are yet to come, and that we're related to things above and to things below and to things all around. It's a way of positioning oneself as a part of God's good creation. And so I think because of what Christ has done for us, I can greet you as your Lakota brother, your uncle, your nephew, maybe some of you, cousin, relative, because in Christ we have the, the reality to become that one new person, that one family, uh, and the wonder of which the reflection of God's divine being, God's character, is seen best in our diversity. And so I greet you, my relatives. Mitankuye, oyansi. So Creator, Grandfather, thank you for this sage and for this smoke. And it reminds me that it's your blood that cleanses and makes new. You purify my mind, you give me a new mind. You purify my heart, you bring healing. So this smoke reminds me, Creator, of what you've done for me in Christ. And that this smoke is like the prayers of the saints that rise up to you. And thank you, God, that because of what Christ has done, you hear and you answer our prayers. Bilamelo, Tungashi, the grandfather, Jesus. So this is a, a blessing song. It's a Thanksgiving song, actually. And uh, inside my Indian drum, uh, I have uh, an eagle feather. And this eagle feather always reminds me of the faithfulness and the goodness of the Creator. Sometimes young men, they'll, they'll run and they'll grow weary. They'll get a little bit tired. And sometimes us growing older ones will faint, will grow weary. But it's always possible because of what Creator has done for us that we can rise up on wings like eagles. And we can experience that place of the shelter and the mercy and the goodness and the faithfulness of our Creator. So I always have this eagle feather in my drum. Now this is not a demonic Indian drum. <clears throat> uh, it's just a good Indian drum. And... Uh, one day, this man, he went out, and he killed a deer, and he made a hide out of his skin, and it was a good deer that the Creator made. It was not a demon-possessed deer. It was just a good deer made by a good God. And he chopped down the tree, and he made the frame of this drum out of that good wood, and it was not an idolatrous tree. Uh, it was just a good tree. So that good man took that good hide from that good deer and that good wood from that good tree, and he made this good drum. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> because sometimes people, they get nervous about Indian stuff. <laughs> and they say, well, it's good and fine you sing that in your language, but if you don't sing it in English, it's, it's not meaningful to me. I'm not edified because... I'm an intellectual, rational being, and I need to understand things rationally in order for them to make sense to me, because I come from a literary tradition, unlike you oral tradition people. So could you please uh, interpret the word so it can be meaningful to me? And I say, shut up. <laughs> I say... The, the, the fact that it's meaningful to me should be enough to be meaningful to you. Because I think that's what the love of God does for us. 
It allows us to love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, I know this is a Christian drum because it says Yamaha uh, <laughs> right on the back here. And um, so I thought to really make it Christian, I should like, you know, make the typical ichthus kind of deal on here or maybe a dove. Um, but I thought with all the debate going on, I do an ichthus and a dove and a dollar sign. Uh, <laughs> with John 3.16 on the bottom. <laughs> so then that people would go, oh, that's a Christian drum. Aha, wado, aha, waikanda ido, hey, oh, hey. Creator, thank you for this time. Thank you for Mark's prayer, his beautiful song, and Holy Spirit for your presence with us tonight. And I trust for your help in these few minutes that we have together for, uh, for our benefits and for your honor, Jesus, I hope. Well, my name, as was said, is uh, Richard Twist. My father is uh, an Oglala Lakota from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, and my mother is a Sichangu. Lakota, as was said, uh, from the Rosebud Sioux Reservation, also in South Dakota. And I was born among my mother's people in 1954, uh, but my mom didn't want us growing up uh, with the violence and the alcohol and the lack of jobs and poverty and sort of still emerging out of this colonialism. And so we left the reservation, as did many people during that era. We ended up in Denver, we ended up somewhere else, and we ended up in Silverton, Oregon, in this little all-white logging town. Now, off the res, uh, there wasn't a lot of prejudice. I'm tall. I was a good basketball player, and sports is typically the great equalizer. So I grew up out west. And so uh, my mom met, moved to the, my dad's reservation. They met. They got married. I was conceived. They got divorced. My mom moved back home, and then I was born. So I met my dad for the first time, really, when I was about 30. And I had an abusive alcoholic stepdad as a young boy who used to beat my mom and beat the kids and was drunk and all that. So my, my vision in life as a little boy was to be big enough to get a baseball bat to beat the schnikes out of him. Uh, but they divorced before I was old enough and brave enough to do that. So then I grew up without a dad after age 9 or age 10. And typical wild kid in the early 60s, drugs and alcohol and peace, love, dove and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So I was double cool because I was an Indian hippie. And uh, that was kind of a double cool thing off the res at the time. It's a whole other story on the res or in the urban centers, but we were in this little... So um, I have a great-grandmom uh, uh, who was an English princess, but I can't prove it. Uh, and then um, I'm part white, but I can't prove that either. Um, so somebody asked me one time, they said, are you, are you a real Indian? I said, yeah. They said, I thought so, because I, I could see it in your cheekbones. And uh, I said, really? And I thought of something to say in response, but I decided not to. So, um, 
So next time somebody says, you know, I can tell you're an Indian. I can see it in your cheeks. I'm going to say, I hate it when people stare at my butt. And um, so I'm just waiting for somebody to ask me so I can throw that out there. But no, nobody's done it yet. So I do, I am part, uh, I have some Scottish, English, and French blood polluting or coursing through my veins in my background. And uh, so I am, I am part of that. And then I, long story, but um, I ended up in jail and I ended up uh, in Hawaii after some stuff. Um, and I was here on this beach all alone in Maui, Hawaii. And I thought I was going to die and I was having this overdose on psilocybin mushrooms and and I remember what these guys told me about Jesus. And nobody ever witnessed to me. I grew up in the Catholic church, but we used to steal the wine from the back of the church and <laughs> steal the communion wafers. And so we were getting drunk in the spirit long before we became charismatics. Uh, so, uh, but, so that was sort of Christianity for me was my Catholic experience. So here I am on a beach, and these guys witnessed to me, told me about Christ, but I thought they were just nerdy little white boy Bible-thumping Jesus freaks. I wanted nothing to do with their white man's religion, so I cussed them out. Because of all the stuff that had happened on our reservation with the Catholics coming to run the boarding schools, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But in 1972, as an 18-year-old, I joined the American Indian Movement after I moved back to the reservation, and I was a participant in the takeover of the Bureau of Indian Affairs office building in 1972. So 600 of us took over this big federal building surrounded by riot police and dogs and tear gas and federal marshals, and we were protesting the federal government's breaking of all of these treaties. So one man said, you know, they, they made all these treaties and they broke one of them. They promised to take our land and they took it. So the other guy said, when the white man came, we had all the land and they have the Bible. Now we have the Bible and they have all the land. So during that time in the, in the movement, I began to open up my soul towards hating white people, towards hating Christianity. And... Um, and listening to all the rhetoric, rhetoric and all of that. So now here I am in Maui. I, I'm losing it. And I remember what these guys said. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I just yell literally all alone, two in the morning, Jesus, if you're real, would you do come into my life? Would you forgive me? Would you do what those guys said? So the fear and the paranoia left. And I experienced what the Bible talks about, peace that can't be humanly comprehended. And so that's where I became a follower of Jesus, was on that beach in Maui, Hawaii. So even though Jesus looked an awful lot like Captain Jack Sparrow, I'm pretty sure that it was Jesus of the Bible. And so that was in 1974. And from that point, I moved to Alaska, where I lived in this uh, Jesus People hippie commune in the 70s. And so that was a kind of a unique experience also. But when I came to be a follower of Jesus, I didn't know any Christians, I didn't know any churches, I didn't have a Bible. I just knew I should stop doing certain things for some reason. So I think the Holy Spirit came into my life. So I stopped uh, taking drugs, I stopped getting drunk, I stopped doing bad things. Uh, but I couldn't flush all my marijuana down the toilet because I just bought it. Um, but I knew I couldn't smoke it. So I just went around blessing people with joints. Um, and... Uh, so they said, give me some of that Jesus. I'm all, How do you get saved? Uh, just bow your head and repeat these words after me. Uh, so we're talking about innovation, right? And uh, so all kinds of utilitarian sort of ways to think about this stuff. Then I found out later on, though, that I, I had to become a Christian. And that was different than following Jesus for me. So then I learned I needed to become a Calvinist. Uh, so then I became an Armenian, and then I became a dispensationalist, but then I spoke in tongues, and then I read the King James Version, because that's the only authorized English version of the Bible, and you can't possibly know what God's really saying unless you read the old King James Version of a particular kind. But then I, thought, I found out about the New American Revised Standard Version, and finally, I said, fooey, I'm just going to read the new Indian version, the NIV. And so that's what I've settled on uh, all of these uh, years now. So then I became a Presbyterian, and then a Pentecostal, and then an Nazarene, and then the Assembly of God, then a Methodist, and on the list went, because Christianity got very complicated for me. And then I found out there was whole, like there was even such a thing as, as a Christian Democrat. 
Because I was led to believe there weren't any. I thought all Christians were conservative, Republican, evangelicals. That's what good Christians were. The mainline liberal people, they were Democrats. So then I thought, then, then I thought well, now this, this Christianity stuff's getting more and more complicated. So now I came to find out that God loved me as a Lakota man so much that he let his son Jesus hang on that tree so that I could experience the forgiveness for the brokenness of my own life, my own sin. But then I found out he loved me, but he didn't like me. He didn't like my long hair, so the pastor said, cut your hair. Then the church said, he doesn't like your drums, because they're, they're used for demonic Indian ceremonies. So no more drums, no more powwows, no more dancing, no more ceremonies, no more ritual, no more sage, no more sweetgrass. That's all pagan and demonic. And the Bible says when you come and become to Christ, you become a new creation, all things pass away and all things become white. Amen. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I guess that's what the Bible says. What do I know? And then I came, I was led to believe the Bible said a whole lot of stuff. Uh, and then as time went on, I found out that certain groups of the, of the Christian community in America, they don't even like each other very much. But when I was on that beach in Hawaii, it seemed pretty simple in the early days. Love Jesus, he loved me, he delivered me. And because I was so saved, if you will, I believed everything I was told because I wanted nothing more than to please Jesus and to walk with him in a good and a sacred kind of way. Now, as the years have gone by, I've come to, to think about things a little bit differently. Now, here we're talking about innovation. So I just completed a doctorate degree at Asbury Seminary, and my main theoretical framework was the diffusion of innovation. So I studied great lengths and read lots of books about the theory of diffusion and the theory of innovation and, and how innovation comes into being. And you guys, you guys like Gladwell, and he's writing about tipping point and the spread of social trends and, and how communities change and neighborhoods change, and they try to commodify that and codify and study it and analyze it. So I read all that stuff. But I read it around the ideas of how should I think about theology differently? Can you innovate theologically? We can innovate methodologically, right? So we can, we can innovate in terms of feeding programs, education programs, we, uh, uh, vocational training. We can come up with lots of new, innovative, methodological ways to deliver this good news. But what about innovation relative to the good news, to the Bible? Now, as I, as I came to, to think about and learn and read books, I came to discover that when I start to do indigenous theologizing, I'm asked to, pair, com, to uh, um, compare uh, all of my findings with old, dead, white reformers. As if to say that they discovered it all and God endorsed it as the reference point for all theological endeavor from that point on. Right? To which I want to say, shut up! <laughs> Why? Why do I have to quote all these old guys? Why can't I quote myself? <laughs> really, why can't I quote myself? So as an indigenous guy, I'm studying anthropology and primal and folk religions, and I, I find out that, that anthropologists create all these categories to understand indigenous, indigenous people. And as I'm reading these books, I thought, oh, that's what I am. I didn't know that's what I was before. Oh, that's what I am. So there's this beautiful book called called uh, Decolonizing Research Methodologies, and she's critiquing how Western academics study indigenous people. We become objects, specimens of, of uh, analysis. But I find that the Bible is used in the same kind of way, that the same kind of reductionist philosophical tendencies, we can read the Bible, reduce it to a set of manageable propositions, and then start uh, uh, using it against other people as if to say we have the best series of Theological propositions, and I'll put a label on it. I'll call it 
neo-Calvinism, I'll call it evangelicalism, I'll call it progressive evangelicalism, I'll call it orthodox, I'll call it something, but I have to have a set of borders in order to feel safe theologically. Now, I don't think God is all that concerned in terms of those kinds of parameters and boxes. I mean, we read the scripture, and there's no such thing as, you know, Christian bank robbers. So stealing is bad, so we shouldn't innovate too far where we compromise the clear teachings of scripture relationally, emotionally, ethically, morally. But in terms of the character of God, I have a difficult time as an indigenous person with how American Western theology has created notions of God's character and we find them embedded in our Constitution and America's history of manifest destiny. And we as indigenous people always suffer the loss of everything. We should have had stricter immigration laws. Talk about immigration. Let's talk about immigration. So let's start. Let's all learn Spanish and just be done with it. All right, I'm having a hard time because this clock says I only have a few minutes left and... Um, I haven't got started yet. <clears throat> okay, so I want to be a good guy here. I'm a new board member, and they, they can't kick me off, I don't think, after my first week. So, But I don't want to give them any reason to think about it. So I am so happy to be a part of the CCDA family, to be uh, a board member. And uh, I really appreciate and greatly value the work of CCD and all of you and what you're doing in your respective areas. So in these next few minutes, I want to introduce you to Native history because you have lots of Native people living in your cities. And my guess is you don't even know we're there. So we are out of sight and out of mind. So I want to help make the invisible visible in these next couple of minutes that we have. Now, they're white man minutes, but they're different than our minutes because our minutes are like Christian minutes. So, so white man minutes are non-negotiable, they're non-flexible, they're rigid, they're legalistic, they're binding, they're, they're linear. But Indian minutes, they're, they're stretchable, you can bend them, they're elastic. So they're like, they're compassionate and kind and merciful and loving. They're, they're Christian minutes. And so, um, uh, all right, nice. All right, muchas gracias, hermano. Okay, somebody asked this old Indian guy on the reservation, they said, well, have you lived here all of your life? He said, no, not yet. <laughs> so is that the correct answer? It was a good answer. So here we go, 1491. Right before Columbus arrives, we got 100 million Native people living in the Americas throughout the Americas, from the bottom to the top, and what we would call the contiguous United States, we have about 20 million. So when Columbus arrived, civilizations and cultures, they're flourishing. So with Columbus, short time later, came colonization, Christianity, and civilization. So here's a, here's a Native American Columbus Day greeting card. So that is not our favorite holiday uh, across the United States. So here's another one. This puts it in a little more sort of in-your-face kind of terms. Can you read that? This is honoring one terrorist and condemning another just doesn't make sense. So in 1892, so we go from 1491 to 20 million here in the U.S., 1892, we're down to 232,000. So in, four, in 400 years, we go from 20 million to 200,000. And so that's what civilization brought to our people. That's what Christianization brought. That's what the Constitution brought. Uh, that's what the Bill of Rights brought. That's the kind of freedom and liberty and justice for all that came to our people. 
So embedded within American colonial history is a distinct kind of theology, the doctrine of discovery. So you know about 1400s, the, the Pope Alexander wrote this papal bull. He gave all the land from here to there to Spain and Portugal. So the northern Europeans, not to be outdone, who were kind of on the fritz with the Pope, they said, we need our own theology. So they came up with this theology of terra nullius, which means the land is empty. So anywhere that they went where there was no king or prince that had Christian loyalties, that land was considered empty and void. So when they came to the New World, that was their theological construct. And then they appropriated all of these uh, Genesis themes of deliverance. So they became the chosen people coming to their promised land, escaping persecution only to bring it to us, escaping oppression only to bring it to us. So while they're uh, in, in embracing and co-opting these biblical themes of chosenness and sending, they did everything to us that they say they, they, they left to escape. And so we became the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Parasites, who stood in the way of they, the chosen people, coming to the new world to inherit the promised land. So there, there's a great article. It's called Canaanites and Cowboys. And really, it, it, it questions me, how can I, as a native North American, embrace this kind of Christianity? What do I have to do to embrace that? How much do I have to hate myself in order to embrace that kind of colonial Christianity? So it's a real challenge to my soul. And obviously I've, I've found some grace to engage with that question in that conversation that doesn't leave me completely discombobulated. So we're, we're working it out. So there, there's an African cat, uh, uh, Tiong Oh, who writes about colonizing the mind. So here's an example of how some of the early Christian missionaries thought. So 18th century, century missionary, John Sargent, he started a native congregation. And he emphasized to his new native converts their cultural inadequacy and their personal responsibility to overcome that inadequacy. And he writes, only through a complete sense of their own inadequacy can natives be properly Christianized. So he felt they could not fulfill this mandate and began a school to assist them toward Christianity with the goal of, quote, the total eradication of all that marks them as native to root out their vicious habits and change their whole way of living. So he's talking about replacing their sense of being and identity with that of the colonizers. So Tiang O, a Kenyan uh, scholar, uh, talks about the biggest weapon that was yielded against indigenous people in the colonial era was the cultural bomb. So he writes, the effect of a cultural bomb is to annihilate a people's belief in their names, in their languages, in their environments, in their heritage of struggle, their unity, and their capacities to deconstruct a people's sense of self, how they perceive themselves, and their relationship to the world. It's the destruction or deliberate undervaluing of a people's culture, art, dances, religions, history, geography, education, orature, and the elevation of the language of the colonizer. So John Sargent, back in that time, the missionary, he did all of that. That was his theology. Now, that was his attitude. He had an ideology about humanity and being human. And obviously, as a European, he thought his version of humanity was vastly superior to that of the native, to the point that in order for them to be Christians, he had to eradicate. And how did he eradicate it? the Bible. He didn't eradicate it through quoting the Constitution and the Bill of Rights because they weren't really going. He didn't quote, what did he quote? He quoted the Bible. So that was his way to help these people reject their sense of being an identity to embrace another. So I hear it all the time. So this is what I hear from my Indian evangelical conservative brothers and sisters. They say to me, Richard, you can't use that drum. You shouldn't use that drum because the Bible says, touch not the unclean thing. Or they say, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. So don't go to powwows. Don't go to the sweat lodge. And what fellowship does light have with darkness? And they proof text all these verses so that I won't be a native follower of Jesus. This is like a couple of weeks ago. 
So, so what happened back then lingers and exists today, and I want to say it's in all of you. Some of it's out of ignorance because you just don't know, but other it's out of a kind of tendency to believe the worst. Because Indians are into witchcraft and the devil and Satan and idolatry, and we don't know what the hell they're doing when they do those ceremonies, and stuff could get on you, you know? And uh, so, yeah, don't, don't, even, don't, don't even mess around with that Indian stuff. So where does that come from? Come from Hollywood? Come from watching too many John Wayne movies? Comes from somewhere. I'm going to say it comes from the church. I'm, I'm going to say it's still a flawed hermeneutic. Bad missiology that flows out of some of our historical traditional theological schools of thought. And we still pay the price for your bad theology. We still suffer today because of your unwillingness to engage with theology and hermeneutics at another level. So we'll try to wrap it up as we get there. I'm on page two of 73 pages of notes. So federal Indian law. Now, here's the deal. The brother, I don't mean to pick on him, but the brother this morning, so it was Jim Wallace and the other brother, and he talked about uh, the, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It initially said, and uh, life pursuit and freedom and the pursuit of uh, happiness, right? But he said originally it said, and, and property, to own property, right? So it's like the audacity to make that statement by the founding fathers that they could arbitrarily say, that they, they took that out to make it broad. They already owned all our land. And the reason they said that is because they didn't want no black people and no Indian people owning land too. That's my hypothesis. Not a moralized, virtuous Christian sentiment, which we're led to believe. But I think that's part of the myth of America being a Christian nation. And if we had a lot of time, we'd go into all the quotes of all those presidents and later Supreme Court judges who made horrific, blatant, theologized decisions about Indian people not being human, not deserving of land, etc. And it's all part of that theology, all of which you are influenced by. So I want to invite you to this conversation about theological innovation, that we, we critique our hermeneutic how we go about interpreting the scripture. All right, so 2011, today we have 3 million. So we're, we're growing. So the, how many of you in here are an enrolled tribal member? Would you stand up? How many enrolled tribal members do we have? All right. Okay, keep standing. Now, how many of you uh, know or are pretty sure that you have native blood in your family. Stand up. All right. We got a whole bunch of you wanting to be just like us. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Thank you. So quickly, in 1887, there was a land act passed called the Dawes Act. All our Indian land was divided up into 160-acre allotments, and each family got one. And the objective was to assimilate Indian people into American society. But what happened is this land was married into, it was illegally taken away, and all the land that was in excess to what that tribe of 200 people got, all that land was confiscated by the government and sold off to white settlers. In 1879, the Indian boarding schools began in America, which is one of the darkest chapters of American history. It's one of the most horrific examples of genocide and cultural cleansing in the history of the world. Speaking of which, we go from 4 million to 232,000 in 400 years. I'm pretty sure that would fit under genocide. I'm pretty sure that would go under ethnic cleansing. And God bless America. Right? Do you know that about your country? Do you know those, those figures? Do you, do you carry that in your soul? We're talking about immigration. We're talking about the poor. Obviously, important, crucial issues of our day. But there's a whole other chapter underlying those ideological presuppositions about what I deserve, what I'm entitled to. 
And if we, if we could just, I don't have enough words to figure out how to say that, but anyway. So we started, these boarding schools were, were, were started to solve the Indian problem. So we went from the host people of the land throughout American history, we are the Indian problem. First we were in the Department of War, then they, they put us in the Department of the Interior. You know what's in the, part of the, the Department of the Interior today? Land, oil, forest, tobacco, firearms. They put native people in the Department of the Interior as a sort of a non-living part of our government's structure. We should be under some other department of the government, but that's where we are today. Department of the Interior, Bureau of Indian Affairs. So this Richard Pratt started the boarding schools, and this is what he said. uh, uh, He's quoting General Sherman, who said, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. So this is what Pratt said. A great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. That became the stated philosophy of the boarding schools in the United States And from that time until 1902, the government built 26 boarding schools. But in the middle part of of this century, there were more than 450 boarding schools run by various social and religious organizations and denominations. So my grandparents went to the Catholic-run boarding schools, but there were Protestant ones in Canada, Anglican, uh, Presbyterian. So now, this was the stated philosophy of the federal government of the United States, our Christian nation. In these schools, my mom and dad went to these schools. My grandparents went to these schools. So the the whole goal was to kill the Indian and, and produce a good assimilated American. But their mouths were washed out with soap. They were physically beaten. So imagine your six or seven year old, they come to your house, they take your six year old, And they put him or her on a train or in a wagon. And from here in Indianapolis, they take your child all the way down to New Orleans. And they put him in a boarding school. And they're so far away back in the day, they can't get back home in the summers. So they stay there for 12 straight years. They're forbidden to speak their language. Their hair is cut off. Their their clothing has changed. Many of them die there. And then they come home. And they settle into the community. They marry. They have kids. Their kids are taken. Imagine what that would feel like when your kids are coming by a foreign people who hate you to take your children, to turn them into them. In the 1960s in Canada, it got so bad they called it the 60s scoop, where the federal government literally went in and took native children out of their homes and adopted them out into white families. All across Canada, these little boys and girls were taken from the scoop, 60s scoop. So now my aunties and uncles, uh, they, they had all these, this trauma. Now here's the, the horrible thing, we'll move on, is the sexual abuse that took place in these schools was unimaginable. The violence, the trauma, the physical abuse, the beatings that all took place during the night as they were all marched into chapel the next morning to get the Bible study for the day and the blessing of the priest, of the pastor, of the workers as they sat in their classes and learned their vocational skills and did their Bible study reading only to have the same horrors enacted against them each night. And that was the Bible. That was Christianity. That was our introduction to the good news. And that's what my parents grew up with. So today, I am the child of boarding school parents. I don't speak my language, though all of my aunties and uncles grew up and were fluent in the language. To protect us from that kind of racism and prejudice, they didn't teach us the language. They wanted us to learn English so we could be successful in the white world. So today, we're recovering from that trauma. The Anglican Church almost went bankrupt about six years ago in Canada because it was losing so many sexual abuse lawsuits. Now, in America, it's going to start hitting the fans in the legal courts over the next 10 years. All these lawsuits in the state of Washington was just a $350 million settlement brought by 150 native boys against the Catholic Church in the Northwest Diocese. You're going to start seeing that happen all across the United States now where all these boarding schools were. 
But you don't even, most of you don't even know there was such a thing as boarding schools. And worse yet, that they were done in the name of our Christ. That the scriptures were somehow used to moralize, rationalize. That kind, now it's, it's the worst because it preyed upon the innocent. That's one of the most horrific chapters in America. It preyed upon innocent little boys and girls. So in the 1950s, there was a federal relocation policy where uh, Indian people were offered uh, jobs, education, and housing if they'd leave the reservation and move to the city. So these are just a handful. Uh, Portland, Denver, Albuquerque, Cleveland, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, uh, Dallas, Phoenix, Tulsa, and a bunch more have significant uh, urban Indian communities. So I, I want to I invite you, as I finish to begin to wrap up here, uh, to get to know the, the urban Indian communities where you live. And maybe you don't live in a city with a large uh, population, but there are other ways uh, that you can get involved in engaging with us uh, in terms of us finding the hope promised to us in Christ. Now, the Child Welfare Act was passed finally in 1978. So the government, 50 60% more often, took our kids out of our homes and adopted them out uh, intentionally into white families. And then in 1924, Indians were granted citizenship. Isn't that amazing? We were granted citizenship as American citizens in 1924 in the United States. In 1934 was the Indian Reorganization Act, where we began to reorganize ourselves as sovereign nations within our reservation governments. In 1978, finally, was the Native American Freedom of Religion Act. For all those years, it was a federal offense to have ceremonies and dances and rituals, so all of our stuff went underground because it was federally illegal to conduct many kinds of ceremonies. And then finally, New Mexico and Arizona were the last two states that removed the final obstacles allowing Indian people to vote in those two states. So this is all going on in our country, in our traditional homelands all across the U.S. So here's my last two pages. Rescuing theology from the cowboy. How do we collectively rescue theology from the metaphoric cowboy, the one who goes with a sense of entitlement to live his or her destiny out in the name of the Lord at the expense of others with no consideration for who they are and what they want? So it's what I call the, the, the imperialization of the Great Commission. So Jesus said, go on to all the world and preach. So we're going to go preach to those Indians and get their souls saved. We don't care whether they want us there or not, because we're under a greater mandate. Jesus himself said we should do these things. But why don't you ask us if we want you to come to our reservations? So what if we did this? What if we went and we said, as non-natives to the reservation, we've, we have uh, uh, this, this, this desire to come and walk among you in a humble and a respectful way. And yes, we're followers of the ways of Jesus. And we believe that what Jesus brings into our lives can help people find the power to escape various addictions, etc. So we'd like your permission to come as guests onto your land. And we've brought you this tobacco. We've brought you these gifts to show our respect and our honor because you are the host people of this land. And we would simply come as guests and walk in an honorable way towards you. What if that's how missionaries began to think about their faith? But we just go wherever in the hell we think we're supposed to go. Guatemala, Nicaragua, Africa, because we got it all, especially American evangelical. We got capitalism. We got evangelism. We got medicine. We got school. We got theology. We got seminaries. We know how to do it. And the rest of the world, if they would just follow our example, could have what we have. Out of control debt. Hallelujah. They could have what we have. What if we began to develop an ethic of indigenous protocol? Innovative theologizing now. What if we began to think about the earth as our mother? Never is the earth dependent on humanity for its existence. Never is the earth dependent on humanity or its existence. We are totally dependent on the earth at all times for ours. 
We come out of the earth, dust to dust. Creator formed first man and first woman out of the dust of the earth and breathed into their nostrils. So all of us are dirt people. 80% water, then a little bit of iron, zinc, phosphate, potassium, a bunch of dirt all compilated together, then the life of God created in the image of God. So what if we think about the environment as our home? What if we think about the earth as a womb that brings life? What if we change all the theological metaphor, like that whole subdue the earth and multiply and take dominion? Don't you think we've taken dominion long enough? Don't you think our dominion has wreaked havoc in the life of our mother long enough? What if we change the metaphor from the natural resources of creation to talk about our mother whom we care for? So the earth is like a pregnant woman groaning and travailing for the coming of the sons and daughters of God, right? So if God is our father, God has to be our mother. Male man in his masculinity is completely incapable of mirroring the fullness of God's divine character. Female man is just as much a mirror image of God's divine being as male man. It's only in the, the union of male and female that we can ever hope to understand the fullness of God's divine being and character, never in one and or the other, only in the both. Let's begin to think about the, changing the metaphor of our theological dialogue and conversation. Let's think about the, the need to be community and family and caring for one another, not just in a utilitarian functional way. Well, you need a couch, come stay on my couch, but, but how do my tears fall on you and, and how do I weep with you? And when we sit in that sweat lodge and it's so hot, we think we're going to faint and we can't stand it. And the pain and the suffering and, and the claustrophobia because it's pitch black in there. You never appreciated the gift of the first sacrament of water more. Water is the first sacrament of life. Without water, we die. Creator keeps us alive. Without air, we die. These are gifts from Creator. What if we live in harmony with creation as a part of our family? The earth is our mother, and as human beings, we live together in harmony and in shalom. I'm done in seven minutes. So we started the North American Institute of Indigenous Theological Studies 10 years ago to begin rescuing theology from the cowboys, to begin reorienting theology from in the clouds and in our heads, to our hearts and in the earth. How do we begin doing theology in the earth? When can theology begin in the earth and wake, work its way back to heaven? As, as organic beings. So even that sort of compartmentalization, I am a spirit, I have a body, and then the soul lives in me. Like, th how rigid is, is that categorization of explaining our being? As indigenous people, we have ways of explaining being. So here's a question. Why can't our native myths, legends, and stories be considered just as authentic and credible and reliable as the myths, stories, and legends of the Bible in explaining the origins of the world? How about that? That's heretical. It's awesome. So what am I talking? Am I talking literal? Like, what are words? See, as indigenous people, we love ambiguity. If, you're not, if you live in ambiguity all the time, nobody gets to be the final authority. But in Western rationalism, somebody has to be the final authority because we need a reference point to protect us from going too far to the right or too far to the left because we think centrism is a biblical value. Why do we think that? I don't think God is at all intimidated or frightened or nervous about what does God want? Everything we got, our all of our heart, our soul, our mind, of our strength, whether we're too much this way or too much that way, but you need us. The body of Christ needs the voice of indigenous people. So we started NATES. We even created a master's degree program in partnership with George Fox University in, in Portland, Oregon. So we have all native faculty that have written of all the courses for a master's of arts in indigenous or in intercultural studies. You want to come study with us? Let me know. I'm trying to reorient theology differently. And then lastly, 
Our organization is called Wichone International. And Wichone is a Lakota word that means go home white man. No, it doesn't really mean that. Uh, gotcha. So, so like Indians, we can say stuff. And you go, is he telling the truth? And I'm not sure. So, um, I mean, it's a Lakota word for life. And in my own life, I know that Jesus Christ has brought abundance into my life so that I can be the best husband of 35 years that my wife could hope for, but I got a lot of work. And if it wasn't for Christ, she'd probably give up on me. I don't have a clue how to be a father to my four sons, the way I grew up, the way my dad grew up. And so my boys love me. We have the best relationship I could hope for, but because of the abundance that Christ brought into my life. So we called our organization Life. And that's my hope for our native people, and that we together can be that body of Christ. But you need to know we're there, and we want your friendship. We don't want your money. We don't want you to come to our reservation and paint our buildings over and over and over and over and over. And uh, we don't want you to, like, win the same 15 kids in vacation Bible school month after month until they're 29. Every person on the reservation is saved if going to vacation Bible school and coming forward to get your lollipop and saying the prayer is getting saved, and they all write home in their newsletters how they saved all these Indian kids. They don't know it's the same 20 as the week before from the other group. <laughs> but we want your friendship. We want to walk in community and harmony because that's what Native people love. We love to be in relation. We want to eat with you and laugh with you. We want to poke fun at you. Because that's how we like to show honor and respect and, and, and affection, by poking fun at you. And you can poke fun back at us. And there's trust involved. So we started, we're starting another deal in, in the August called the Salmon Nation Internship Program. And it's going to be an intercultural, interfaith, multi-ethnic effort to help young men and women become better human beings in the spirit of Jesus. But it's going to be very open around the edges. So we want them to learn to love deeply, to care generously, to walk in humility at a whole new level by learning to love those who are different. Missio Dei has to do with the mission of God, Trinitarian thought. So here's the last and final thought. I'm following Dr. Perkins' example here. He says, I'm getting ready to wind up. <clears throat> no, I am winding up. One of the most profound points of learning for me in the last few years has been thinking about God as community. So I, I put this picture of the Trinity up here for you. If we could put that back up. So here's a notion of, of Trinity, maybe through the Indian eyes. But it doesn't fully capture the sense of, of oneness that, that I want to imagine in the Trinity. So you have the interconnectedness, the interrelatedness, the interdependency, the intertwinedness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As God the Father and God the Son look upon the face of God the Holy Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit and God the Son look upon the face of God the Father. And they look upon one another, and soon we begin to experience this, this notion, as I think about it, that God is one because God is three. That you cannot have unity in the absence of diversity. Unity cannot exist in the absence of diversity. Unity is only possible in the midst of diversity. God is one because God is three. So think about that. You can only have unity in the midst of diversity. Otherwise, you have conformity, uniformity, or a weird kind of sameness. But that is not the, the nature of our Heavenly Father. So as a Lakota man, I am inviting myself into your life to be your friend. I don't speak for all Indian people. I don't speak for my tribe. I'm not a chief. Uh, I'm just a... So don't call me that. Uh, honkies. 
Um, so, you know, somebody said, well, what should we call you? Some of you might be wondering, should we call you Native American? What's the politically correct term? Well, I'm going to tell you. So people say, should I call you Indian, American Indian, Native American? In Canada, it's First Nations or it's Aboriginal. Um, so what should we call you? I said, well, just call me Wagon Burner. That'll be sort of sum it all up, a little history, a little whatever in there. No, don't call me that. Uh, just call me Brother, Brother Richard. So I was thinking, what should I call white people? Because, you know, I could, like, say Caucasian, Euro-American, Anglo, Eurocentric, pale face, uh, honky, Q-tip. So, like, I could, like, out, come up with a whole bunch of words. So I was in a moment of divine uh, intercession, and I was praying, God, what should I do? And so God gave me a politically correct term for white people. It's pigmentally challenged. And so that just sort of captures it all very nicely and shows honor and, and important respect and uh, allows us uh, to move forward as the body of Christ. So I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and invite you into some reflection, uh, in the innovation, uh, in terms of how we think about what the Bible says. And uh, I know we didn't get a chance to go very far, but just give you some food for thought, and again, I'm grateful for the opportunity and for your respect uh, to listen to me uh, as I'm able to share it today. So this is a song that just ends by saying, I'm walking with my creator. Uh, next line says, I'm walking with my savior, Jesus. And the third line says, I'm walking on this chonku, and chonku means road or path or trail. So we call Jesus chonku. So to be a follower of Christ doesn't mean you belong to something, doesn't mean you go somewhere on a day of the week, it doesn't mean you ascribe to a certain set of dogmas, but it does mean you live your life in a way that reflects the character of a loving Heavenly Father. And it does mean that you live in a way that shows that love to those that are around you, your own families, in a way that makes sense to those who desperately need to know the love of a Father, the love of our Heavenly Mother, if you will, and the love of our Creator. Wakatanka et kia mawani hidu hei heira hidu hei heiro hiyo hai hai de wani kie Jesus, thank you for your love and your kindness. Heavenly Father, for your mercy that you continue to create yearnings in us to know you deeper. And you draw us close to yourself by your spirits. And you speak to us through the scriptures, through the body of Christ. And in these ways, we come to know you. We come to become better human beings. And the world comes to know that there is a God in heaven. And his name is Jesus. Aho.